amazing. Um, we are uh, really excited to get into this. This is brought to you by Shack 15, Oakland Art Murmur, and the Immersive Arts Alliance. My name is Michelle Antoinette Nelson, AKA Love the Poet, and I'm your moderator for this evening. You can clap for me, it makes me feel good about myself. Thank you, thank you, appreciate you. And we're just gonna get right into it. Such an exciting conversation about public art and holding space and how these amazing artists here hold space. We have Dana King, we have Jonathan Crawford, we have Kareen Smith, and they're gonna all give their introductions and tell you about themselves and their work. So Dana, please talk to the people about who you are. Thank you, Michelle. Did you see the look on my face? I was like, okay, nobody told me I was gonna have to introduce myself, but um, I am a sculptor and I create black bodies in bronze. I love sculpture. It's physicality. It inhabits space. And space is power. And it is my belief that, um, that it's vital for there to be art in the public realm that represents the story of African descendants. I have pieces in Montgomery, Alabama at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. I have a piece in South Berkeley of the very first African-American elected to the California State Legislature from Northern California in 1948, Byron Rumford. Uh, I have a piece in uh, New Haven, Connecticut of an African descendant who helped to build that city. Self-taught engineer, a free black man named William Lanson. I'm installing, not me, <laughs> many people are installing um, a bust on the 24th of October in West Oakland. Uh, a bust of Dr. Huey P. Newton, who was the co-founder of the Black Panther Party. And I have a piece here in San Francisco, in Golden Gate Park, the first African American to have art in that park, um, an installation. It'll be there for two years. Thank you. We're decolonizing that space. And uh, it's called Monumental Reckoning. And it's 350 ancestral figures that encircle the Francis Scott Key plinth. Francis Scott Key, I'm embarrassed to say, wasn't until I was 60 years old I knew what a, I found out what a horrible person he was. I wasn't taught that. None of us were taught that. Um, and so when the question arises, what should we do with monuments in this country? The monuments to white supremacy. The monuments that were built in the 60s and 50s and in the 20th century to intimidate and to, and to try to keep people down. What should we do with them? A lot of people say take them down. They're part of the story. They're part of the history. And um, that history needs to be 360 degrees of truth. And so I say, well, let's put some sculptures up right next to them. <laughs> let's put some sculptures up around them. So the ancestral figures um, are four feet tall, and their size does not reflect their power. They are standing there for justice. 402 years later, justice, because they represent the beginning of chattel slavery in this country, the first boatload of human beings who were brought to Virginia in 1619. And there were 350 of them that, on that, that were taken, and only 21 survived. But we're honoring all 350 with monumental reckoning. So that's a little bit about me. Awesome, wow, wow. And this work, we're showing the work of the artists as we introduce uh, ourselves, and it's so powerful. Thank you, thank you. Jonathan. Gotta follow, You're good. Gotta follow that up. Okay. 
Um, my name is Jonathan Crawford. It is an honor to be here. I am a musician. I am a multi-instrumentalist, um, producer, and DJ type dude. Um, <laughs> and um, my initial foray into what I guess you could call public art was through jazz and performing in the street, performing with various different ensembles in public settings. Um, where I'm from in North Carolina, I was involved in uh, the Triangle Youth Jazz Ensemble and got to play with some pretty cool um, jazz legends back from my hometown and um, even abroad. So I'm kind of coming at this from a jazz background and over time I made my way into music production. I downloaded GarageBand as the moment that it came out and basically never have had a life since. Um, I uh, got introduced to Immersive Arts Alliance out here um, who I got the chance to DJ some of my debut EP, which is called Depths. And it is a very sound designy and um, dark ambient and experimental uh, EP, which really kind of laid a sonic baseline for me as I was to release later. And I've since branched out into many other areas, including pop performance, R&B, hip hop, um, dance, and also DJing. So um, there's a lot that I'm excited to talk about. I'm relatively new to the Bay Area scene. I got here in 2015 and, I'm sorry, 2016, and have been sort of active in the nightclub and live event space and um, looking to sort of bring more of my ambient style programming through Immersive Arts Alliance to a few events coming up in Oakland. Um, that'll be sort of targeted for April. Um, happy to talk more about that as we dig in, but that's a little bit about me. I'll pass it off. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, and up next we have Corinne, who I don't know if many of you know this or if all of you know this, but the mural that's on the other side of this um, shade here, this, this uh, curtain, is created by Corinne. So if you haven't seen it, please go around there when we're done and check it out. Please. <laughs> yes, run over there right now. Um, hi, I'm Corinne, um, or Kriti Smitty. Um, I um, am an uh, illustrator and muralist based out of Oakland, but I also love um, branching into other media of art. Um, a lot of what I do um, really is a cathartic way for me to express how I'm feeling. Um, and art for me has been an integral part of healing um, and sharing joy and rediscovering joy. Um, when I, I, I mean, I've been making art since I was a kid and I studied it in school, but I had a terrible experience um, in art school. Um, was one of very few um, black women in my program, and um, I very much felt like I did not belong in art spaces um, through that experience. And so um, not practicing art for a while left quite a void in me, and so I slowly started making art for myself as a way um, to rediscover the joy that it had always brought me. Um, and it has just kind of exploded from there. Um, and I'm so grateful to have rekindled that relationship. And really a big initiative of mine is navigating sadness, grief, and loss through art and uh, bringing that joy to other people as well. Um, another thing I love doing is portraiture. I love drawing anyone that inspires me if it's Maya Angelou or Megan Thee Stallion, like I'm here for all of it and I always like to do a little showcase of everything um, like that once a year, hopefully more when I have the capacity. So um, that's a little about me. Oh, yes, <laughs> I, I love that. I love the spectrum that you just created. I, I'm visual, so from everything from Maya Angelou to Meg Thee Stallion, 
That yes. <laughs> Yes, and since and since we are talking about what you love to create, and um, how did you like? What led you to create public art? What got you into that? So, um, as you know, a lot of us have been in isolation uh, for a lot of this pandemic, and um, with the barrage of things popping up in the news and the unfortunate string of murders that continue. Um, I felt um, a big pull to express myself and express um, myself in communion with the rest of the community. So um, I was um, commissioned from Subversal, which is an organization based out of Oakland, um, to create a mural in Piedmont, which is where it was, and it was um, the first public art piece that I ever did. So it's a very new venture for me and I've fallen in love with it. And just being able to be around um, the community to have conversations with people after not being able to really speak with a lot of people in person for so long was such an incredible and invigorating experience and um, I'm so happy that I get to continue doing it. Dana or Jonathan, please. Thank you. Um, so it was an accident. Uh, which has kind of been my whole life. Um, I kind of fall into things. Uh, I, I created sculptures, small sculptures, and um, I'm represented by the Thelma Harris Gallery in Oakland. And um, little did I know that my work had come to the attention of a, of a woman named uh, Mildred Howard, who is an international public artist of renown. And she was working in community in uh, South Berkeley with the first African-American vice mayor, female vice mayor of the city of Berkeley. Um, uh, okay, there went her name right out of my head. That's terrible. Uh, it'll come to me. Um, and another community member. And they wanted to have a sculpture put up in South Berkeley. South Berkeley used to be um, an African-American centered community. Uh, all the stores and the doctor and the dentist and the, and the dry cleaner, everybody, everybody, all the stores were black owned. And, and the area has gentrified. And so they wanted to put up a sculpture for the new residents of South Berkeley to let them know the history of South Berkeley. And that was a sculpture of Byron Rumford. And um, so Mildred recommended me. And, and it was going to be a bust, which I could do. But then I went away for a week, and I came back, and they said, great news. We got the, the Berkeley Art Commission to commit to a sculpture, a life-size sculpture. And I'm like, that's just great because I have never done that before. So, and I'm not kidding you, I, I, I went back to art school, but I, 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 I was in the um, MFA program for fine art painting. I didn't even, you know, I didn't even take a sculpture class. So, anyway. So I went to Home Depot and I bought uh, plumbing parts, big, thick, black, hard, plumbing parts and made his legs out of the plumbing parts and I poured concrete into the middle of it so it would still stay. It worked. It worked. Um, I don't recommend it. And um, as soon as the mold was made of him and, and then started and taken apart so that we could turn it into bronze, he collapsed. He just like, he it was mush. He was total mush and he just fell to the ground. So anyways, I say all that to say it was an absolute accident. And I fell in love with um, trying to create likenesses of people really large. And, uh, and, and I, I guess I just like a challenge. And, and it's been an incredible journey since then. So, um, and he's still standing in, West, in uh, South Berkeley. And um, the, okay, one more thing. The joke is, is that, so he was put up in the median strip in, in, of, on Sacramento Street at Ashby. And, oh, someone lives over there. All right. <laughs> 
And he was a pharmacist, and his pharmacy was is kitty corner to his, his sculpture. But anyway, so <laughs> he's seven feet tall, and people, I can't tell you how many people stop me and say, you know what? When I first saw Mr. Rumford, I thought he was a, I thought it was a man stepping out into the street. And so the unintentional benefit of having a sculpture there is that it, it's been a traffic calming. People drive really slow by Mr. Rumford now. So he made the neighborhood safer. But, oh, that's great. <laughs> but now he's got a big lighting installation and the whole thing over there. But, yeah. Wow. That's how it happened. Amazing. Jonathan. Yes. Um, my transition into, and I would say that, you know, when it comes to public art, I'm still fairly fresh, especially here in the Bay. Um, in my upbringing, in my musical education, um, I was really fortunate to get to play drums with some really dope jazz bass players um, in a public setting, open concerts. And um, uh, John Brown and the John Brown Quintet um, and uh, Christian McBride um, in Philadelphia in uh, thank you. <laughs> He's really good. <laughs> I was like starstruck the whole time. It was crazy. Um, but, um, and, and so being a drummer is really the core of, um, uh, my, I want to say being, um, as an artist, that's the first thing that attracted me to music as a kid. And, I guess any time that you're playing drums and you have neighbors, it's a form of public art. Um, uh, but um, yes, and so this rhythmic aspect of drumming and doing it um, in social settings has always been what inspires me and motivates me no matter what form of music I do. Um, from playing to DJing and across the board. And um, so, yes, jazz. Awesome. So, yeah, you can clap. You guys can clap. It's, one, it's okay. Yes, yes. Um, feel the energy. If you feel like you want to snap and, and, and say yay, do it. Do it. We welcome that. Um, so, Jonathan, uh, we were to give the audience a little bit of background, we were talking about public art before we got up here, clearly, and um, what it looks like in different settings and, and how it's expressed to different people in different places. And Jonathan had a great question. So in this moment, Jonathan's gonna be moderator for one question and ask the question, and we're gonna do it that way. So Jonathan, please. Um, my question was, um, regarding this topic of public art, um, I think the initial intuition is to think of it as free, right? We think of public as no cost, zero barrier to entry. And of course, this isn't exactly true, maybe in theory, but depending on how it's set up, depending on where it is, um, there's a major accessibility um, concern that has implications for what the scope of that public art can be and who it can reach. Um, we were talking about this across all uh, demographics um, and my question was, you know, where do you, what do you think the importance of that gradient is um, in defining public art? So, Dana or Corinne? <laughs> All right. Well, as a public artist, you have to get permission, right? So you have to go through the San Francisco Art Commission, for example. Um, you may, depending upon where the piece is located, there might be another entity you have to go through. Um, for Monumental Reckoning, we had to get approval from the Rec and Park as well. We're also um, going to, the bandstand in the park is uh, going to have the words lift every voice on top of the Spreckles bandstand on December 1st. We're going to have a, a poetry evening with the San Francisco Poet Laureate, uh, Isa, or Tango Isa Martin, 
and his friends um, to honor Lift Every Voice, which is now in direct opposition to the Star Spangled Banner. And it's a way better song. It's a way more important song, a way more beautiful song. It's about liberty and justice and unity. And uh, the Star Spangled Banner is about war. So I say all that to say that there, there, is a, uh, there is a path, a permission path to public art. And on that path, questions arise around accessibility. Questions arise around, um, I have a piece I'm working on um, that'll be here in San Francisco. Um, for every, every different type of accessibility issue, physical, visual, auditory. Um, so, so those questions get answered, but, but the, what I heard from you is accessibility in terms of transportation. How are you gonna get there? My piece in Golden Gate Park, they just shut down a major thoroughfare through the park um, to increase safety. And I understand that, but it was also a bus route. And um, so un unless and until there's an, an alternative, that's an issue in terms of accessibility for people who don't have cars, um, who don't live near the park, um, so that they can gain entrance to the park. But I, I like to believe that public art, because you can come upon it intentionally or accidentally, that there's a learning there regardless, right? That that art is there for a reason um, and hopefully to inspire and enlighten and educate and, um, and bring people out and into community so that they could talk to other people that don't look like them, they might have a different opinion about the art. You know, we don't, we're not talking lately. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not judging, I do the same thing. I got my phone, I got my earbuds, I got the whole nine. But um, the point of it is, is to engage and, and for there to be engagement. But the accessibility issues are, they're very important to be to, as a consideration. So, you know, you might have a great idea, but it has to go through this level of permission. You have any thoughts, Corinne? Yeah, I think um, this piece in here is probably the one that is the most difficult for people to get access to that I've made. And I think it is a big element of what I'm doing um, if I'm like setting up at like, let's say, a neighborhood show, or I'm doing um, a mural elsewhere, I think I do want them to be accessible because I had an experience where I felt so isolated, even when I was studying in school, right? And so I think especially having the piece that I have in the Tenderloin was probably the most rewarding experience because I was around my people. and. Um, them feeling inspired and bringing their sketchbooks up to me, taking pictures with me. We'll go to the corner store and get some snacks and just hanging out while I'm making my work. Like that is accessibility to me. Like that is someone else who feels inspired or we connect because we're both artists and there's no hierarchy. There's no, I can't do this. It's like, I see you out here and I see you doing this and this inspires me or I wanna do this with my kids, or like I'm gonna go and draw my sketchbook right now, and then having people like set up their house in front of the work that I made. That's like, this is like their living room, and this is amazing. Because it feels that way, that's their home, you know? And this, these are people who, you know, I worked in Union Square for a long time, so I'm originally from Detroit, and coming out here, it was a whole different world of having to like, walk over people and um, just seeing people not treated as human beings, not treated as the beautiful people that they are and how they should be treated, how they should be seen, how they should be able to navigate the world. And so um, I do think it's important to make public art more accessible. And I think it's also pushing to 
Um, you know, even to what you're saying about all the the process that it is just to put one piece out. It's also making sure that you're asking the right questions to the people that you're working with and making sure that you're not being singled out as a token to create this work, that you are also having like these very important conversations about who and what you're aligning yourself with and the work that you're putting out into the world. Um, and so I just, I just really think that accessibility is not just transportation or being able to get to the work. It's feeling like this work is accessible in my life. Like I can do this too. I have the ability to do this. I see someone that looks like me out here doing this, so that means that it is accessible to me. Um, that's Absolutely. Um, Dana believes that space is power. When I heard Dana say this, I was like, light bulb moment, right? Like, space as a creative and as an artist is power. How, and, and I totally agree with that. How have all of you reckon with that? Like, how does that show up in your work or just in yourself as an artist? Like, space is power. Anyone can take it away, anyone. Jump in. Um, wow, yeah, that was a, such a powerful statement. And I think um, a lot of it was just navigating my own personal barriers I had put up for myself on a narrative I was telling myself about who I am, what I can accomplish, and um, you know, really letting other people's opinions or what other people said about me or to me affect the way that I felt about myself. And so um, the way that I'm taking my power back and stepping into my power is unlearning all of that <laughs> and trusting myself. And a lot of that comes through in my art where, you know, I was actually having a conversation um, maybe a year or so ago um, about a zine that I had just created and that blue was just a really hard color for me at the time, which is one of my favorite colors. and it was just really about navigating through what came up when I was seeing that color, when I was feeling that color, I would dream about that color. And through working with it, even though it was bringing up a lot of pain or other you know, experiences that I had, I had to work through it to find the joy again. And so um, I think that working through a lot of pain has really been what's helped me grab my power back and just not letting that consume me, working with it, seeing things for what they are and saying I have control over myself, I don't have control over anything outside of that, but it is powerful to say to myself like none of these things are true um, and I have the power to be who I want to be. Um, I have the power to say no. I have the power to leave a terrible job and do what I need to do on my own because I have the support and I have the faith in myself. Um, and a lot of that brings me a lot of joy. And I hope that's what comes through in my art is that I've been able to push through that and I can still stand and I'm still here and things just continue to come <laughs> from just staying true to myself and believing in myself and honoring myself. And I feel like that joy has brought me the most power. Jonathan. I'm totally vibing with your interpretation of it as psychological space in a way. Um, I think a lot of it is that yes, physical space is at a premium and it is very powerful, which is why it's really important for spaces like this to be having conversations about it. Um, but I think this is something that everybody can relate to and is probably one of the most um, dominant themes of inner growth that was experienced by people throughout COVID is holding your own space throughout a period of loneliness and um, what you find through that and the power that you find through that is always um, something that takes you to the next level, always something that gives you more strength. 
Um, and so in my work, I find holding space to be all about letting the noise um, be what it is and like you said, staying true to yourself, um, continuing to work on whatever it is that you find important and um, you know, knowing that you're not doing it alone. Um, it's rare that you find individuals holding space. We need communities to um, be able to, um, to last, and especially in um, areas like art and public art. Um, we need mindful communities. And so uh, it's awesome that we are able to vibe around that topic here today. And um, yeah, holding space, very, very powerful stuff. And Dana. Well, I'm not that deep. So, um, but no, I, I totally am hearing you and, and agree. And, and it's beautiful. And, and that's what art should give the creator as well as the audience. Um, but I'm pretty literal. Uh, I'm a sculptor. My work is physical. And it takes up literal space. Right, um, I I I subscribe to um, the Sufi poet Rumi, um, who has said that wherever you stand, be the soul of that place. And I want my work to be the soul of that space it's taking up. And it's definitely what I, I intend to create with is a, is a depth of understanding about the, the person I'm creating, the opportunity to hmm, not bring them back to life, but create living energy around them that encourages people to, to learn more, learn more about the sculpture, the person I'm, I'm, whose likeness I'm, I'm creating, but to learn about themselves in relationship to that piece of work, to learn about their own history in relation to this work. So, um, it's about being able, for me, it's about children being able to see their parents, their aunts and uncles, their grandparents standing before them in bronze, signifying their importance and knowing that in our history, we didn't begin as enslaved people. And to, and to recognize that we have built this country literally, figuratively, and that much of, much of, of our history has been buried, that we don't tell it, that we don't share it, that we don't, that we don't, it's not part of any curriculum, it's not a universal truth, and, um, and so it's in taking up that space in history as well as that physical space in wherever the, the piece is installed and taking up space in people's heads and in their hearts. Um, and knowing that not only is it all of our history, but that it can be done by people who look like that sculpture, that it can be done, that work can be done by the people closest to that history, and that's accessible to, to us, to black people, to people of color, to indigenous people, that we deserve to, to take up space and to, um, and to share our history because it really is in the sharing that that history can live on. 
And when you work with bronze, thank you. Um, the beauty of bronze is that it lasts really forever. <laughs> We're talking, you know, what was that movie where uh, Statue of Liberty was in the water and their monkeys were running the show? Uh, Planet of the Apes. Okay, that bronze was alive. It's still there, right? But, but seriously, it, it lasts forever. And what it allows as a material to happen is that you, you tell the story generationally over and over and over again. And that story, that truth, that history lives on for as long as the bronze lasts. See... We missed our moment. That was when we were supposed to slide out and, and sit in front of her. <laughs> we, we, we have all had an amazing experience um, listening and, and, and speaking with Dana, and we were joking beforehand that at some point we were all just going to slide out and sit in front of her and just listen. That was it. That was, that was the moment. It's just Ron's, age. Ron's last forever. That's going to echo in my brain. Thank you, Dana and, and Jonathan and Corinne. We have one more question. That's it? Yeah. It's time? It's time. We have one more question. Um, how can people support this work and help create gener generational wealth for specifically black artists and artists of color? By our work. <laughs> that. <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, let's let's dive into that. Um, yeah, I mean, also buying the work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think, you know, now that we have so many ways to share work, that's not necessarily um, always crediting artists. It's making sure that we are crediting artists where that credit is due. Um, and making sure that we're distributing it amongst, you know, our community. I feel like it, maybe it was just when I was in school, but it's like, hey, let's, um, I really want to get into X museum or I want to work at this place or this gallery space where, you know, it's not really representative of other people of color. It's not really representative of other queer folks. So um, I think a lot of that is making sure that we show up in our community and are constantly invested in our community and making sure that we're um, make, taking the initiative to find different businesses within our community. If we're, like for myself, to do mural work in, within the community, just making sure that you're actually always funneling it back in. Um, yes, I'm in wholehearted agreement with those um, sentiments and just would add that you, anybody can and should get involved with um, making the community more collaborative and accessible and diverse through art. It is something that is the mission of all people and um, you know, it's important to respect the different angles through and lenses through which we, we might do that, um, BIPOC artists of color being one. But if it's something that moves you, whatever, uh, um, you know, form of creative art that you are passionate about, it's always worthwhile to get involved. Um, I think there's a really exciting sort of renaissance or perhaps reconstruction of culture here in the Bay. And there's a lot of new stuff popping up all the time right now. So keep your eyes open, you know, subscribe to your newsletters and, um, you know, just pay attention. I think that's one of the most powerful things you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was thinking also before I let uh, Dana close us out with her, with her answer, um, artists are also entrepreneurs. Artists are also, you know, really their own small business. And um, just thinking about how, as opposed to just really like buying the, okay, this piece of art or I'm gonna pay for this show, what about investing, right? And 
and and really saying like I, I I believe in you. I'm gonna sponsor this or I'm gonna invest in you this amount of money because a lot of times when people think of artists, they just think of people who are hobbying for a living. And and that's just not the truth. Um, <laughs> um, and and it's the heartbeat of the world. It's the heartbeat of community. It, it sets the tone for all things. Really, art does. And Dana, you said something on on our call previously about how you your ideal way of receiving funding. Can you talk a little bit about that? You talked about who you want to support your work and how you want our dollars to be cycled. So I think that is really what sparked off this question, but I think it's, I think it's important. Okay. I could do that. Can I also answer the other Yes, one? please. It's all, yeah, all related. So Monumental Reckoning, $375,000 for a two-year installation. We hired a fundraiser, because <laughs> we needed to. Um, I asked that the fundraiser pursue communities of color for their involvement. Ask them to participate. Don't assume they're not, they can't, they're not gonna. And, and I go back, this, and where this comes from is, is the Obama connection. Obama had people bundling millions of dollars for him, right, big money. But the most beautiful money he got was the $5 in an envelope written by somebody's grandma who said, I want you to be my president. I have waited my whole life. This is all I can give you. That means as much, that $5, as the bundled millions because it's the soul of what he was doing. And so I asked for Monumental Reckoning for the money, the fundraising to be pursued in communities of color. More than 70% of the money that came in came primarily from black people, but from all, also other people of color. That's a lot of money. And, and oftentimes we just don't ask because we think, no, they ain't got no money. But you know what? People want to be invited. They want to be asked. They want to participate, however they can, however they can show up. So that's, that's that message about we need to, we individually, I mean, you know, art is to me like wine. You can have a thousand dollar bottle of wine that tastes like vinegar, right? But you sit there and you go, oh, this is so delightful. It has, it has notes of blueberry. <laughs> I believe Oregon blueberry, right? <laughs> tastes like shit. Art, art to me is like, do you like this? Do you love this? Buy it on time, you know, lay away, right? You don't have to throw down thousands of dollars. Galleries exist because people love art and they pay however they can pay. But if I can go back to the, um, the question of how can they support the work and help create generational wealth for artists? Yes. Okay. Whew. Thank you. Um, I'm going wide on this. There is a canon of black art. And we know what it is. The world should know what it is. When we think of art, it shouldn't just be the old masters. It shouldn't just be the Michelangelos. It shouldn't, it, it should include the canon of art of color. That is equity in art. There are Native American museums. There are museums to Hispanic art. There are black or dedicated museums. There are, there are, there's a museum for, for, for um, mermaids. Okay? There are two museums for mermaids. I didn't know there were that many. But, exactly. So, yeah, this is what you're going to take away tonight. Yeah, there's a museum to mermaids. But, um, so I say all that to say that um, that canon of art needs to be cracked open. 
And um, I know as a, as a student who um, clearly someone's calling me that doesn't know I'm here tonight. Oh, boy. Sorry, Pam. I can't talk to you right now. Um, and, and the way that that gets cracked open is that we have equity in institutions, that we have curators who are black. We have curators who are Latinx. We have curators who are Native American. We have curators who are LGBTQ. We have curators who represent the world, right? If I've left anybody out, I'm sorry. Um, but you know what I'm saying. And so that means educational institutions have to open up their programs, their, their museum studies programs, and search for students who don't know that this is their path, right? Reach out. Don't wait for people to come to you as an institution. Anyway, so so I say so so I'm just saying that the that the institution of art um, needs to build equity into itself on all levels: employment, representation of art. Uh, Buyers, who who are the buyers? Um, how how did you bring them in? Um, on all levels, the institution needs to open up, and that will that will be the path for um, for all of us, and we'll all be better for it. We'll all be better for it. I can only I can I love Rembrandt, but come on. Right? <laughs> Come on. I mean, Picasso stole from Africans. Right? Let's see some African, contemporary African art. You know, the de Young has plenty of masks and spears. And they have a curator for African art. And that's awesome. But Native American art is not just beautiful handmade bowls and, um, and, and, and art on leather. It, it's all out there. It's all out there. And it's all available to all of us. And it needs to be the canon of art. Yes, yes. I, Thank you. I hear a call to action. Look for it. Dig for it. Google it. If you don't know, you can find out. It's all available. You just have to set your intention to see it. I think that's a message. That's the message I'm receiving from that. And, and, and I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Dana King. I want to thank you, Jonathan Crawford. I want to thank you, Corinne Smith, uh, for being here. Is there? Can you each briefly tell how people can reach you on social media or however it is that you can be, your work can be found? Sure. Um, my social media handle, I just have an Instagram, at Critty Smitty. And then my website is CrittySmitty.com. Critty Smitty. Critty Smitty. C-R-I-T-T-Y. S-M-I-T-T-Y. Yes. I am JC underscore, AKA underscore, Jonathan, JC, <laughs> AKA Jonathan. Those are my two names. And um, my website is jonathancrawford.us. Awesome. It, danakingart.com. It is not up to date. It will never be up to date. <laughs> I'm on Instagram, but I'm really bad at that. Uh, Dana King Art 360, you know, get it, right? Um, that and and I'm at the Thelma Harris Art Gallery, but um, go to Golden Gate Park, please, please. Golden Gate Park, please, please visit the ancestors. I'm there every Thursday morning at ten o'clock. Sorry, who made my jacket? I bought it online <laughs> <laughs> from an African uh, African website, African clothing website. Afrikia. Look up Afrikia. You find whatever you want. You Afrikia, Kia, Afrikia. Anyway, um, yeah. Please go. Yeah, go visit the ancestors, please. 
Thank you. Yes. And I am Michelle Antoinette Nelson at Love the Poet. L O V E T H E P O E T. Lovethepoet.com. I'm an artist too, but I am also a professional host and moderator, and that is art as well. And I'm so glad to be here with you all. And guess what I just found out? We have time for a little bit of Q&A. Hey! We are here at the Bay Area Art and Equity uh, Conversations with artists, Bay Area artists of color, and it's time for a little bit of question and answer. We have Jaron with the microphone. If you have, we have someone here, right here. Um, so thank you, that was, and thank you for curating the panel and thanks to the panelists. Um, I'm very interested in the intersection of public art and protest. Um, and I guess I'd like to hear from any of you sort of where you think the line falls between the two or where both lines intersect, and so on. I've got a reaction to this. Um, I feel that um, when I hear public art and protest, I think of something like Black Lives Matter. And I think about the way that it was and is used to um, A, occupy space, and to be sort of a um, cultural movement that just replicates itself. And, um, you know, I think in a lot of ways, holding space, whether or not we do it on our storefronts or on our front doorsteps or um, in large murals, um, it's a form of protest if we are um, speaking out. And I think, yes, um, protest is built in to public art on the, intrinsically. Uh, I consider my work, I'm a classical figurative sculptor. I consider it subversive because I am taking a medium that is predominantly used to enhance the Eurocentric point of view and has been used um, in monuments to white supremacy to intimidate, and I am recontextualizing and reclaiming it when I create an African descendant to be, to be existing in the public realm. Everything that I do is a protest. And uh, I wish it weren't so, yeah. right? I really wish it weren't so. I wish I could just, you know, sculpt flowers. <laughs> But, you know, the... That would be a protest, too. Flowers are great, right? Because, yeah, because I would have to kill them to <laughs> create them. But anyway, um, sorry, that's ridiculous. But I wish I didn't have to. Um, I, I, I wish there were more sculptors of, of representational pieces. Um, because there's just one of me... And I know like five other black sculptors, that's it. I know there are more, but there aren't many. And we can only do one piece at a time, you know? We can't, we, there's, no, there's no printing press for that. And so I just wish it weren't the case, but that's where we're at, you know? We're celebrating the 55th anniversary of the Black Panther Party. Um, all this month um, in West Oakland, and you know, we're still we're still struggling with the same issues: housing, jobs, healthcare, police brutality, lack of freedom, and and until their ten points, their ten point program is answered, which is a path for us all to take, because the Panthers were about unity. They brought everybody to the table, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, LGBTQ, Native Americans, poor whites, 
And they all sat at the table and said, wait, that's happening to you guys? That's, I thought it was just us. And that's why the government was afraid of the Panthers. It was because of unity. So um, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> you started talking about protests and went right to it, right okay, to the point. Yes, so, it's still yes. all those struggles still exist today. So that's why it's all about protests. Okay. Corinne. Yeah, I would definitely agree, obviously. And um, the first gonna... um, mural that I did in Piedmont, which is very gentrified. I mean, I haven't lived in Oakland for more than three years, but, you know, I lived over in that area and it's definitely kind of like, what I'm seeing happening in Detroit and, you know, tons of other cities too. And so um, in that mural that I did, just to speak on that point too, about how, you know, the time, the year is different, but a lot of things are the same in different disguises. And that piece is my, a portrait of myself and Angela Davis and us looking, you know, gazing at each other. And I think a lot of you know, any work or even the piece in the tenderloin is definitely like you are forced to look at it <laughs> in a way. So um, I love that it's in your face and all of the murals in downtown Oakland, especially, it's unfortunate that they have to be there under that circumstance, but also it is a forced reminder to everyone of the space that they're occupying and um, a forced reminder of what is present and has not left. Um, so yeah, it's definitely an act of protest and are all, all in the same. Awesome, do we have another question? I think we just have, uh, they, he just, he just handed it over to the student lady. Do we have time for more than one? Because if not, I'll defer to him. Um, I, I think defer to him just in case. No? Okay. <laughs> Yo, sorry. Black man from Hunter's Point. Um, yeah, I mean, it, each one teach one. I'm, I'm really, like, focused on the next generation, right? You know what I'm saying? And I really resonate with what y'all were talking about with holding space and the idea that you can do that, right? I didn't know I could do what I'm doing currently. Like, you know, and I know there's one point where y'all might not have known y'all could do what y'all do. Imposter syndrome is real. Um, but I don't really think it's imposter syndrome. I just think it's a lack of knowing that you can use your hustle that you've been given by the universe to do something. So how do you, how do y'all like work with the youth? How do you, how do you tell little homies they can do this as well? What, is, what how does that work in your life? Great question. Does it work in your life? Yeah. Um, actually, one of my biggest joys. I I don't anymore, but I um worked with um, kids for a long time as a art camp teacher. And also, <laughs> um, I have managed a lot of people who are probably like 10 plus years younger than me. And it was one of the biggest joys ever to show them that they can do whatever they want to do. And I have been there. So just knowing all that I've accomplished over the past decade, that there's no way that I would have thought I would be here doing what I'm doing now 10 years ago. And to be able to say that to people like, oh, <laughs> this is gonna pass and I don't wanna, you know, like shit on your moment because yeah, these are real feelings and you are experiencing this right now, but there's so much more that's gonna come and there are gonna be some dips too. But um, anything is possible. And so um, just being able Again, just working on murals outside, you know, outside for eight hours a day. Um, and just people are passing all day. And so kids will come up and ask if they want to, if they can help paint. How do I do this? So it's just really showing them and just being an embodied example of what they could be um, if they want to. And it doesn't necessarily have to be art. It could be anything that they're interested in. But um, as long as you have the passion to do it, then you can do it. Each one, teach one is vital, right? It, it, it's really, it's one person at a time. Um, I, I used to volunteer in the um, Alameda County Juvenile Justice, Justice Center, and, um, and I met <laughs> the funniest, most creative young brown and black men I have ever met, and, and many of us are still in contact 
uh, with each other. And but they, what they don't know is that they're they, they're taggers. Well, that's a font, right? You could make that your font. That's that's a business thing, right? I mean, so the, you know they tattoo that you you're creating on a canvas. Hello, so. So there's that, and and whenever I have an installation, I work. I, I um, well, I'm always out there every Thursday, 10 a.m. Um, at the Ancestors in the Music Concourse in Golden Gate Park. But that it really is. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. I do zooms with schools, and you know, every February, you know, even though I'm black all year, they invite me to be there for Black History Month. So. I used to say no, because you know, I let my ego get involved. Like, no, I'm black all year, I told you that. But, um, but now I just like, okay, I'll be there, whatever. You know, we'll do this. And, because um, look, the bottom line is you're reaching kids, period. February, January, December, doesn't matter. Awesome. Jonathan. Um, well, I wish I got to work with kids a lot more, but kids, I can say without a doubt, are the best audience members. Um, if I could go on a tour and play 16 Under, that would be just lit. Um, but <laughs> we <laughs> usually that's not how it works. Um, uh, no, but um, I think one thing I think about is um, as a black man, presence and just being in touch uh, is just a way to um, be there for any young black men out there who just need more people to look up to. Um, it just kind of is woven in often uh, to what I try to do and where I try to reach. Um, and often, you know, of course, I'm not like out there trying to only target black kids or anything, but um, when That's I... It's okay, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but when I reach out, I do often um, sort of imagine that audience and sort of the maybe extra level of resonance that I might be able to have with them. I know that was certainly a factor for me with my music teachers um, growing up. Um, and so um, presence, being there in a conversational way with your values and being open um, to those values whenever there are kids that are involved in your work and just making sure that you almost kind of dial in um, because whenever there's kids in the audience, I think they're kind of the most important ones. All right, all right, wonderful. So I think that's it for our, our Q&A, but we do have time. You ain't gotta go home. You can hang out for a second, talk to the artists, um, engage, ask the questions that you may have. Uh, we are here for that. So thank you so much for being with us on our final Bay Area Arts and Equity conversation. Um, Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Corinne. Again, my name is Michelle Antoinette Nelson, and we are so glad you were here tonight. Thank you all. Good night.